Good evening. Welcome. My name is Adam Scher. I am the Vice President for Collections and Exhibitions, and I welcome you to your Virginia Museum of History and Culture. The VMHC acknowledges the Powhatan Confederacy and the Monica Nation that inhabited the land where this museum now stands. We seek to honor that history and maintain thoughtful relationships with those indigenous peoples and all the tribes of Virginia. Their story is integral to Virginia's past, present, and future. We'd also like to acknowledge the generosity of former trustee Ann Worrell, who endowed this lecture series in honor of our former president and CEO, Dr. Charles Bryan. So I hope uh, you all have marked your calendars for uh, next Wednesday, the 19th, when we will be holding the 2022 Hazel and Fulton Chauncey Lecture here, where we will have the distinguished Civil War historian, Gary Gallagher, who will be talking about Jubal Early's 1864 Shenandoah campaign. Uh, also mark your calendars for the day before Halloween, uh, October 30th, uh, where Virginia House will be holding an open house where you'll have a chance to peruse the grounds in the house. And that will be from noon to four. Uh, and that is a free event. Uh, there is no registration required. But we're very happy to have uh, Robert Pierce Forbes here with us uh, this evening. Um, uh, did any of you attend noon's lecture today? Oh, good. Good. Well, we've been advertising this as a uh, Founding Fathers doubleheader, so this is the Twilight game, um, and I'm glad that so many of you have decided to return. Um, the name of uh, Robert's talk tonight is The United States of Virginia, Jefferson's Invention of America Through a Virginian Lens. When Thomas Jefferson used the term, my country, he almost always meant Virginia. Nowhere is this truer than in his only published book, Notes on the State of Virginia. Released while the United States was just taking shape, Notes on Virginia profoundly influenced the perception of the young republic by foreigners and countrymen alike. Through his subtle but powerful rhetoric, Jefferson made Virginia stand in for America as a whole, while revising the meaning of all men are created equal thereby writing Americans of African descent out of the narrative of American liberty. Robert Pierce Forbes taught US history at the University of Connecticut and was the founding associate director of Yale's Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance and Abolition. He is the author of the Missouri Compromise and its aftermath, Slavery and the Meaning of America and the editor of Notes on the State of Virginia, an annotated edition upon which this lecture is based. Please give a warm VMHC welcome for Robert Pierce Forbes. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, I spoke yesterday at Monticello, um, and one of the most interesting questions that I got that resonated with me was, um, how did you choose to work on this text, which is notoriously difficult? Um, it's a very complex work, uh, so much so that um, the Thomas, the papers of Thomas Jefferson have never done it, have never annotated it, even though uh, the um, legendary first editor, Julian Boyd, uh, told uh, William Pedden, who did what has up until now been considered the definitive edition, uh, that they were going to do it, and that's why he couldn't have access to the actual ma manuscript. Uh, he had to work with a microfilm um, uh, version 
that obscured a whole lot of the of the um, information in it. Uh, the document uh, is a sprawling thing. Um, it was initially written, prompted by uh, the, it needs, it needs to see my face to turn on, there we go. Um, it was initially prompted by a questionnaire that, uh, that the secretary of the uh, French legation in Philadelphia, uh, Francois Marbois, uh, sent to all representatives from all of the, uh, the 13 states. And the, we still have about two or three of them. Um, the one for Connecticut, where I am from, was done by Roger Sherman, and that uh, was for handwritten pages. And he answered pretty much all the questions that, that Marbois had. Jefferson's uh, report to Marbois was 30 handwritten pages. And if any of you are familiar with Jefferson's handwriting, uh, he writes in an incredibly tiny hand. So uh, 30 pages, which is what his original uh, report to, to uh, Marbois uh, constituted, is 90 pages of, of printed text. Um, and so what I, I've, I've worked with the original manuscript, which is, does anybody know where the, the manuscript is, is, is housed? You would think, maybe. It's at the Massachusetts Historical Society. <laughs> they have, in fact, the largest collection of Jefferson documents outside of the Library of Congress. Um, and I was asked when I spoke at the uh, Mass Historical Society why that was. And I said, because Jefferson's favorite granddaughter married a Coolidge. Um, so, and in fact, this week they're having a, uh, a program there on the Coolidges. Um, the manuscript is filled with revelations. Um, it grew from 30 pages, which he, the, the 30 pages which he sent to Marbois. Um, immediately after he uh, finished it and sent this off, he began plans to expand it. Uh, and when three years later, he, or actually a year later, he went to uh, Philadelphia to try and catch a, a, a boat to France, uh, where he was appointed uh, one of the peace commissioners, never got there. Um, he took it to one of the most famous printers there, and at that point, it was uh, 116 pages. Um, no, at that point, it was 88 pages. But it was too expensive. The printer wanted too much for it. So he decided to take it with him to Paris. And it was published in Paris for a quarter of the price that was, that was uh, quoted in Philadelphia. So it's made the final thing. He's, put, he's, he's sort of cut and pasted. Uh, all kinds of inserts into the original uh, manuscript that he started with. Um, the base pages are supplemented by 63 attachments, which vary in size from a single line to an oversized page, pasted to the base page with sealing wax. Most of these have extensive strikeouts uh, and interlineations. In total, more than 6,300 words have been obscured from the original manuscript, uh, almost all of which I have restored in footnotes, uh, making it possible to compare Jefferson's original thoughts and intentions with the language of the published book. And when I actually saw the manuscript for the first time, you know, I had been, been trying to decipher uh, what he had written and then scratched out. So I would fill up 
an entire oversized uh, monitor with one word. Uh, and I was used to looking at it you know, in, 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 a, in a very enlarged uh, form. Uh, so to see these tiny pages and all this incredibly tiny handwriting just found, found that extraordinary. Um, I have this. So Jefferson consistently described notes as a casual haphazard production. He said it was worthless, a trifle, a poor crayon. <clears throat> to Madison, he wrote, do not view me as an author and attached to what he has written, I am neither. That was all uh, completely deceptive. In fact, Jefferson painstakingly crafted notes over six years and invested more labor into it than perhaps any of other of his uh, productions except for Monticello. Um, Notes was published 240 years ago, more than almost 240 years ago, and it has almost never been out of print. The manuscript, which is one of the few printer's manuscripts that have survived from the 18th century. We don't really have any of these. You finish printing the book and you throw away the manuscript. Um, it's been available to scholars for most of this time. <clears throat> and today it's available on the, on the web in a high resolution scan that the MHS put up there. Yet no one until now has studied the manuscript in detail. When I mention this to classical or uh, medieval historians or to scholars of literature, that, that dumbfounds them. They can't believe that. Um, so as I say, Pedden, who prepared the, 18, the 1955 edition, was kept from the, the manuscript. Um, and had to work from this microfilm. Um, Douglas Wilson, the former director of the International Center for Jefferson Studies, wrote in a great paper uh, that he did in the Virginia Ma uh, Magazine of History and Biography, uh, which is published here, that Students of the origin and history of Jefferson's notes have not been well served by their principal source of information, the, its author. And after working with this book for almost twice as long as Jefferson took to write it, I can attest to the accuracy of that statement. Nothing in this work is accidental. It's an incredibly carefully constructed document. The most obvious example of the difficulty Jefferson makes for the reader uh, or the editor is on the title page itself. Um, Jefferson completed notes in France, as I said, in 1785. Yet on the title page, Jefferson writes, uh, somewhat corrected and enlarged in the winter of 1782 for the use of a foreigner in dis of, of distinction in answer to certain queries proposed by him. This statement implies that the document that the reader is holding is the version that Jefferson sent to Marbois. In the manuscript, Jefferson writes that the revisions had been completed uh, in the years, in the winter of 1782-1783, and then scratches out uh, the 1783, um, and gave 1783 as the in Roman numerals as the as the publication date at the bottom of the, uh, of the um, manuscript. Now you can see he scratched it out and he scratches it out. The, uh, the final I, Roman numeral I uh, on the date is, has been very carefully removed probably with a um, uh, pen knife. So, that's interesting. That's, I think that's significant. You have to ask yourself, why would somebody backdate uh, a book by three years? Um, now, for one reason, uh, he wants it to seem to be the 
the document that he that he originally sent to Marbois, which would be an extraordinary uh, thing to to have done while governor of Virginia during the course of uh, an invasion by Benedict Arnold uh, and the uh, death of a child and his wife. Um, it took longer than that to actually do this. I think I understand the, the reason for it. Um, and I'm going to try to, uh, to, I'm going to try that out on you and see what you think. <clears throat> so, in terms of the content of, no, of the notes, Jefferson is famously in dialogue with the most celebrated French naturalist, the Count de Buffon. Um, and he had made the, what to Jefferson was an inflammatory assertion that New World species, including Native Americans, were smaller and more feeble than those of the old world. And that those transplanted from the old into the new would inevitably degenerate. He also sought to refute the famous slur of the Abbe Reynal uh, that America has not produced one good poet, one able mathematician, one man of genius in a single art or single science. Jefferson made a credible counter argument in both cases, but he also faced a more troubling critique of America's failings uh, from this gentleman, uh, the Reverend Richard Price, who was a, uh, a radical British minister and mathematician and the author of a hugely best-selling 1776 pamphlet um, that supported the American Revolution. It came out just about the same time as Thomas Paine's Common Sense, and it sort of filled in with um, political philosophy the slashing uh, uh, arguments uh, of, of the most popular pamphlet ever written uh, in, in, in America. Um, so this was the work that Paine was, that. Uh, Price was most famous for in America. But in 1784, he wrote a new pamphlet um, in which he lamented the Americans' increasing dissension, their growing income inequality, and their thirst for European luxuries. Is there anything important to them which they can draw from Europe except infection, he said. Indeed, I tremble when I think of that rage for trade which is likely to prevail among them. It may do them infinite mischief. So to price the most abominable form of trade was the African slave trade. Until the Americans took steps to end this cruel, wicked, and diabolical practice, they have a, uh, and abolished slavery, Price wrote, it will not appear that they deserve the liberty for which they have been contending. For it is self-evident that if there are any men whom they have a right to hold in slavery, there may be others who have a right to hold them in slavery. <laughs> Does anything strike you about that sentence? Where have you seen the phrase self-evident before? <laughs> and there's a strong reason to believe that Price deliberately intended this sentence as a dig at Jefferson. Um, employing the term self-evident, as in we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now, very few people in 1784 knew that Jefferson was the author of the Declaration of Independence, and you know, even fewer cared. It's a, a, a state paper uh, issued by the Continental Congress, and uh, I will... Uh, give a gift card to anybody who can tell me who is the author of the United States Constitution. Uh, Madison is the intellectual author, but he's not the person who wrote it down. That was the, one of the New York delegates, a guy named Governor Morris. Um, and his uh, 
the table on which he wrote it is not an icon and his house is not a national uh, monument. So it's it, it would seem unusual that that would be so important, who actually wrote a document of this nature. Um, it is a rather extraordinary document, however. Um, but as I say, very few, people, very few people knew that Jefferson was the author of this document. Uh, one of them, of course, was Benjamin Franklin, who chaired the drafting committee uh, in the Second Continental Congress. And lo and behold, Benjamin Franklin was Richard Price's best friend. Um, he's also, as some of you may, may recall, uh, the guy who scratched out Jefferson's first phrase, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable uh, and replaced it with self-evident. So the fact that he added this famous passage, this famous word to the, to the, uh, the declaration, I think it would, be, it would be unlikely that he would uh, not make a comment to his best friend that, that he was responsible for that. Um, so Jefferson may have been thinking about Price's first American pamphlet, even before he read his second pamphlet, which he almost certainly saw from, uh, from, uh, from Franklin as soon as he got there uh, and very quickly got a copy sent to him directly from Price. Um, let me back up for a moment and tell you, this is sort of where I came into this project. I can remember exactly where I was when I started the project. Uh, I was in uh, a house that we were renting on Block Island off of Rhode Island. And I was on the phone with somebody. Uh, it was August of 2011. And I said to the person, I think we've just had an earthquake. Any of you remember the earthquake of, of 2011? It happened right near Montpelier, the, 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 uh, which is also right near a nuclear power plant. But um, that was, it wasn't the day that I started doing this work, but it was, this, it was the week. And the reason that I was, uh, that, that I made the decision that I had to, I had to work on Notes of the State of Virginia uh, which I'd never really, I, yeah, we all think about it, or at least all of us historians think about it. Um, uh, but I had been working on something completely different. I, mean, uh, I started my historical research uh, in, on the topic of the racial attitudes of the British abolitionists. Um, and what I, that, that paper, which was a, a junior seminar paper, it should have taken a semester, took me a year and a half to write. And the reason that it took me so long was that it took me a year to fully assimilate and, and accept the information that I was finding that these British abolitionists did not possess racial attitudes. They did not write in those terms, uh, that they were not working within a paradigm of race uh, in any way, shape, or form, which in a sense makes, makes sense. Uh, most of these folks were, were uh, uh, evangelical Christians, and for them, what was important was, you know, God has made all uh, nations of the world of one blood. Um, every, we're all descended from the same two people, Adam and Eve, uh, and the big issue is not uh, are you black or are you white? It's, are you saved, right? What must I do to be saved? Um, they're operating within a providential framework. And the thing that most concerns them is that uh, God's judgment on, on uh, Great Britain for prolonging the slave trade uh, is, is a great danger to the nation. Um, and this is less of an issue for Reverend Price because he is a, uh, uh, a nonconformist and a, a, a deist 
Uh, he doesn't think in terms of providence all that much. Um, but that comes back into this. So this is the, the passage uh, that I found very interesting from Notes on the State of Virginia. And I'm not sure if people in the back can really read it clearly, especially since it has the, the uh, S's that look like F's from the 18th century. Uh, but the first difference, this is part of the famous passage in Query 14 um, that is so shocking uh, to uh, a modern conscience. And in fact, what I found was fairly shocking at the time. The first difference which strikes us uh, is that of color. And is this difference of no importance? Is it not the foundation of a greater or less share of beauty in the two races? Are not the fine mixtures of red and white the expressions of every passion by the greater or less uh, suffusions of color in the one? Uh, in other words, um, uh, blushing, right? Uh, preferable to that eternal monotony which reigns in the countenances that immovable veil of black which covers all the emotions of the other race. Add to these flowing hair a more elegant symmetry of form, their own judgment in favor of the whites, declared by their preference of them as, is, as uniformly as is the preference of the Oran Utan for the black women over those of his own species. A wholly fictitious statement. The circumstance of su superior beauty is thought worthy attention in the propagation of our horses, dogs, and other domestic animals. Why not in that of man? No. Um, I want you to put aside the shocking content here and focus on, on this expression that I've highlighted, eternal monotony. Because it turns out, I've been doing some text uh, analysis uh, 18th century text analysis on a different project altogether, but and finding very interesting things. Um, but the phrase eternal monotony seemed strange to me. It didn't seem like how you would describe the features of black people. Um, that's not the way they are, for one thing. Uh, so I did a search in. Uh, the 18th century, you can go online and see all of the works published in the, in the 18th century and, and, and search them on computer. Um, and Google has a program called Google Ngram um, that shows the incidence of different words of phrases uh, from the beginning of printing to uh, about 2000. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. And when you combine those two things, the, 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 um, the um, incredible database uh, of all of these uh, 18th century works, you find that, there, that the expression eternal monotony only appears four times before 18, 1785. Once is, uh, Samuel Johnson talking about the eternal monotony of starving artists living in garrets. Uh, two of them are about the eternal monotony of um, Alexander Pope's rhyme scheme, uh, his Alexandrines. Um, and the fourth is in the work of this man, uh, John Shabir, um, who is a uh, a, a, a writer for hire, a hack writer uh, working for uh, the British uh, court. Um, he had actually been uh, convicted of, uh, of um, blasphemy against the, the king and, and was stood up in, a, uh, in the stocks in, in the middle of London. Uh, fortunately, somebody held an umbrella over his head because it was raining. Um, He's, he is a, a shady uh, character of, of the type that we have many of uh, still today. Um, and he wrote the, one of the many uh, attacks on the, the 1776 pro-American pamphlet of 
uh, Richard Price. And one of the features of this of, of pro-American writing was to talk about how, how Britain was was um, was enslaving the colonists. Uh, and he writes this. On what just foundation is this eternal monotony of slave, slavery, enslavement of the colonists, tyrants and tyranny by the Supreme Legislature, which like the drone of a Scotch bagpipe eternally accompanies all the notes and tunes that are played on it. Notwithstanding this indisputable representation of the truth, whoever reads Dr. Price's observations and all the other declamations so vehemently urged against truth and the conduct of the legislature and is not acquainted with the real state of facts will naturally be induced to believe that the parliaments of Great Britain, the parliament of Great Britain had sold the colonists, man, woman, and child as slaves to work in the mines of Mexico and Peru. Um, interesting. There are other passages which um, in notes on the state of Virginia which tell me that Jefferson is thinking about this. Um, as I said, Price's pamphlet was extremely popular. And he has a passage uh, about the Americans comp contrasting the, the behavior of the Americans to the behavior of the, of the English during this period of the revolution. From one end of North America to the other, they are fasting and praying. But what are we doing? Shocking thought. We are ridiculing them as fanatics and scoffing at religion. We are running wild after pleasure and forgetting everything serious and decent at masquerades. May we not expect calamities that shall recover to reflection, perhaps to devotion, our libertines and atheists? Is our cause such as gives us reason to ask God to bless it? So compare Price's anguished statement to Jefferson's fav famous passage in Query 18, his anti-slavery passage. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever, that considering numbers, nature, and natural means only, a revolution in the wheel of fortune, an exchange of, of situation is among possible events that it may become probable by supernatural interference. The Almighty has no attribute which can take side with us in such a contest. So Jefferson has here borrowed Price's phrase, I tremble when I reflect, from 1776, and answered his question and added it to, uh, you know, which side is providence likely to favor from 1785. Uh, but the clincher is this uh, highlighted passage, eternal monotony. Um, this passage, uh, I tremble for my country when I reflect that, that God is just, is probably the most famous passage in, in Notes on the State of Virginia. And it's, it's, the one, it's one of the ones that's inscribed in, on the site of the Jefferson Memorial. So it's rather surprising to look at the, uh, at the manuscript and see it, here it is in tiny, I've told you how tiny the handwriting is in, 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 in the, the manuscript, in really tiny uh, letters. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. So he's put it, he's, in, he's uh, interlineated between two lines. This is uh, probably one of the last changes that he made to the manuscript before it went to the printer. Uh, in March of 1785, which is probably just after he received his copy of Price's uh, second pamphlet. Um, and Price then writes him a letter and he and he's very um, forthright in saying, uh, I, I feel I may be uh, I may be made ridiculous by the response that I'm getting from America for my support for uh, the revolution. Um, he, he, like Lafayette, is not happy with what's going on over here. Um, so what you have to see in Jefferson's uh, 
very shocking passage is it's not necessarily what he believes. It's what he needs uh, his readers to believe. Um, the way I summarize the, the book Notes on the State of, of Virginia in, in, in a phrase uh, is Thomas Jefferson, 1776, all men are created equal. Thomas Jefferson, 1785, I rise to revise and extend my remarks. Uh, so that's where I'll leave it uh, because I really want to hear the questions that you folks have. Ah, I'm glad to, that's what we need, a little bit of light on the subject. I think there are uh, microphones um, that will be going around that you can, if you put up your hand, someone will, will, uh, will give you one. I need questions. Every, every time I get questions, I learn something new. Yes. Well, Hang on just a second. Here comes your, here comes the microphone. So I'm not sure you answered the question of why he changed the date. Ah, good. That's that's the critical thing, right? He wants it to be written before he read Price's second pamphlet. It needs to it needs to be he what to he be always his. believed, and not what uh, he's writing in response to the Reverend Price. Um, that's my sense of why of why he did it. Got it. Okay. Hmm, a great question. By the way, how many books were printed? Um, of this first edition, 200, <clears throat> just 200. Um, and he writes to, uh, to Madison, uh, I, I'm, holding only, I'm holding back only, only three books. Uh, I'm sending you one and, and, uh, and Colonel Monroe one. Uh, and that's... Those are the only ones that are going out. Oh, except for all of the students at William and Mary College. <laughs> so this is a good example of what I say. Reading the, the tendency we have to read what Washington, what Lincoln, what Jefferson wants you to think he's writing instead of what he's actually writing. Uh, because everybody says, you know, he tried to keep it very, very much within limits uh, and was horrified that it would have a broad audience. No. He was, he was uh, sending pieces to uh, the American Philosophical Society. He had pieces uh, published in European scientific journals. And he sent 30 copies to uh, the most uh, distinguished uh, philosophers, uh, the enlightened folks in, in Europe, um, and, and key people in the United States as well. It's interesting. One person who is very surprising that he did not send one to, and who's writing and begging him to send one, uh, is is his uh, his former teacher George Wythe. Um, I think he was n he would not have been happy with Wythe's uh, reaction to his comments on on uh, on race. One last just comment: We actually have. Uh... I don't think it's one of the original 200, but it was printed by Pritchard and Hall in Philadelphia. Yeah, that's a is, really important one. It, that, that's that's one of the um, the original uh, pirated editions. Um, and yeah, it was in my wife's family. We're, oh, that's fantastic. We're, that's we're a, donating it to the Library of Virginia. Great. But, uh, we brought it tonight just. Oh, just, that's so just, exciting! Just for oh, that's so exciting! What it's yeah. Worth. yeah. This this was a, a worry to uh, uh, to his publisher in, in London uh, because he thought it might dilute the, uh, the, the sales of the official one. Uh, over here? Wait a second. Is the rich film that uh, he sent to the French uh, in Quara still exist? The audience still exists. Right. So the question is, does the original report that, that, uh, that Jefferson sent uh, to the French, um, the secretary, does that, does that still exist? It does not, unfortunately. Well, I take that back. It, it, it does not appear to exist. Um, 
there are a few scraps that may be from it uh, that are in the collection of the of the uh, of the Frick uh, collection in New York, um, which were and he mostly connected uh, Henry Clay Frick mostly collected autographs. So they're always cut up, uh, and the stuff you really want to read is missing. Um, but I think there may be there may be he made lots of copies for people. And there may be a copy remaining. Um, I don't think people have really searched the archives for what they are not looking for. Um, but I, I, he had a, a, a close friend who was a young Dutchman. Uh, and I believe he sent him a copy, um, Van Gisdorp. Uh, and I think that the next place that I would look would be in, in the, the, um, the Dutch archives to see if I could find it there. That would be, that would be a, a real coup. These corrections and expansions that he made to the original, did he make it on the original manuscript? Occasionally he made it on the, on the original manuscript. Um, other times he would put in these, these sort of uh, uh, post-its which he attached with sealing wax, with, uh, with sealing wax. Uh, and then he sort of sewed the whole thing together um, and it was a nightmare to, um, to, dis to dis disassemble. But now it's incredibly well presented on the, the Mass Historical Society's website. Uh, if you buy the book, um, go online, uh, it's, it's masshist.org, um, and, and you can follow along there, and you will find it fascinating. And if you find any, any errors, please let me know for the next edition. You mentioned that you, th you thought um, Jefferson would not have provided or did not provide a copy to With, and that With would have, because he thought that the With would have a strong reaction to his comments on race. So I'm wondering, what do you think With's comments would have been, and what in particular about the things stated in the notes in, on the state of Virginia would With have been responding to? Very good. This is this is purely a hypothesis with me. I don't I don't talk about this uh, in 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 the book, but with was uh, a a very uh, deep and 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 um, and philanthropic uh, uh, person. Um, he left he left in his will. He left his estate. Uh, to a young uh, former slave who he freed, and uh, he and that slave were were poisoned, were murdered by uh, his nephew, um, who got away with it because the only uh, witness there was a witness was uh, a slave and was was barred by Virginia law from testifying against a white person. Um, that happened more often than you might suspect. Uh, and the, what, what, what's going on in the center of query 14 is, as you can see from the passage that I cited, is an attempt to really separate uh, and, and create two um, diametrically opposed branches of humanity. Uh, and it's it's uh, it works so well that we assume that that's what everybody thought back then. I don't think I've ever had a student uh, who didn't believe that when Jefferson wrote "All men are created equal," uh, he only meant uh, whites and and didn't consider blacks to be men. Um, that's he. That's clearly not the case. As in the first draft of the of the Declaration of Independence, he one of his charges against uh, George the Third is that he's 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 established markets where men uh, are sold like like chattel, uh, and the word men is in double sized uh, all capitals. So uh, 
If you want to know how Jefferson felt in 1776, there it is. Um, I think that would have uh, bothered with who was such a disciple of the, of the moral philosophy of the Scottish Enlightenment, which was the core of which was in the only thing that really matters, in the only thing that really matters, which is the moral sense that all people have it, all people are equal. Um, that was that was sort of undermined by uh, Jefferson's uh, writing in in Query fourteen. And I might mention the Query fourteen is the passage. It's the it's the chapter that de deals with laws. Uh, so he's embedded in the middle of his chapter on laws this long excursus on how we have to. Uh, you know, slavery is wrong. We have to end slavery. We have to emancipate all the slaves. But if we're going to emancipate them, we have to send them out of the country. Uh, they cannot live together with whites. Um, and he comes up with a, a, a plan that would have cost more than the interstate highway system. And this is at a time when the Virginians are refusing to pay taxes to, to keep Benjamin, uh, to keep Benedict Arnold at bay. So uh, good luck uh, getting them to support this this equivalent of multi-billion dollar project, uh, not even with federal funds. You know, I always wonder, about, uh, at that time, nine of the 13 colonies were slaveholding yes. colonies. So the chances of any documents saying all men, including black men, are created equal, ever making it out of that room is zero. You know, so I always wonder how much of this is, you know, 2022 right. history. Right. This is exactly the right question. Versus what was happening at that time. Right. This is exactly the right question. Uh, because I need to I need to um, to convince you that this is what people thought. And the, the most important factor that I can talk about is life is different during revolution. In the midst of revolution, it seems as if anything is possible. And uh, in 1782, just to give you an example, in this state, uh, a law is passed legalizing manumissions and, and uh, over 10,000 slaves are freed. An interesting thing about that 1782 law is uh, there is no requirement for the freed people to be removed from Virginia, which there will be later on in, in the 1790s. Um, there's nothing suggesting that they can't be productive members of society. Um, there's a moment in either late 1776 or early 1777, I don't know which it is, when Jefferson is a delegate to uh, the Virginia Assembly. Um, and he's, uh, his friend Philip Matze, or Mazi, as people uh, in Charlottesville call him, um, is, is recording this conversation uh, among Jefferson, uh, George Mason, and another uh, delegate, Virginia planter. And Jefferson says, <clears throat> it's, it's crazy that we enslave people who uh, are exactly like ourselves, who do, who do not differ from ourselves except in color. There's no justification for it. And I, for one, uh, would be uh, willing to uh, to put my uh, my back to the plow, um, if uh, if this is necessary uh, to get rid of slavery. Um, Matze says, "Yeah, this is not a great idea. Um, for one thing, if you if you free the slaves while we're under attack, while we're while we're being uh, uh, attacked by uh, the British." They will take it as a sign of weakness uh, and, and rise up against us. 
And then George Mason uh, chimes in and says, um, you can't free them until they've been educated because they will then, uh, since, since work is exactly what they've, uh, they've come to detest, uh, they will shun it uh, and um, be a burden on society. So uh, Matze says, uh, at this point, um, all were convinced, and Jefferson first of all, uh, that this was a bad plan. So it's almost like you can date the moment when people start going, hey, wait a minute, uh, the world is not changing on a dime. Uh, and we've got to, we've got to come up with a plan B to, to all men are created equal. Um, but it is, it's clear that, uh, uh, Win Winthrop D. Jordan, the great, uh, historian who wrote a huge book called White Over Black that gives the whole history of, of anti-black, um, uh, thought in, uh, America from <clears throat> 1500s to uh, the 19th century. Uh, he pay, he points out that Jefferson's statement is the is the most radical uh, racist statement uh, published by an American for the next 50 years. So it takes a while for this to to hit. And I'll give you one other example that I think makes the case. I could give you many, but I'll just give you one. Um, Alexander Stevens, in his famous uh, cornerstone speech, um, when he when he becomes vice president of the uh, of the Confederacy, uh, says that uh, we are the first. This is the first country in the world, the first nation in the world that is based on the fundamental truth that uh, the white man is superior to the black man. And he says, "I know that there are that there are many out many of you." probably uh, in, in, in this audience uh, who remember when we believed that all men were created equal, but it, it's, it's within our lifetimes. It's within 30 years, he says, which brings you back to about 1830. Um, and that's where I actually started my work, was looking at what's changing in, around the 18, 1830. So it's, it, it doesn't make any sense. The only other explanation of why you can have slavery and not have racism is because when you have slavery, you don't need racism, right? If you have the complete power over uh, a group of human beings, <clears throat> for them to be useful, you have to recognize their skills. You have to be willing to be completely intimate with them. Um, that's why... This book is written for the for for Europe and for the North. It's not written for the South. The South would understand that this is this is rhetoric. This is not how things are. Uh, there is no line between black and white. Uh, there's every shade, and if you go to the top of the mountain, um, you'll find a lot of people who uh, will eventually uh, be freed. By Jefferson and pass as white. And not a lot of people, you find some people. And there are other people who look a great deal like Thomas Jefferson. Um, that's, that's what every uh, slaveholder knows, is there's no dividing line between blacks and whites. There's, there's a, uh, a mixture from day one. What type of reactions did Jefferson get from people like uh, John Adams or Benjamin Franklin? Jefferson, uh, Adams writes to Jefferson that your passages on slavery uh, are like diamonds. You know, he's talking about query 18, which is a excoriating attack on slavery. Um, uh, he says that the that the the um, the child who is exposed to the intemperance of uh, a slaveholder uh, who thunders and wrath uh, uh, from his from his cradle will be um, 
uh, I can't remember what, what, what he says, but the, 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 he changes that from, uh, from the third person to the first person, uh, the first person plural. So he's pretty upfront about the damage that slavery uh, is doing to slaveholders. Um, Adams is also, interestingly enough, as a, as, an, as a Massachusetts man, you might find this surprising, but uh, Jefferson did not. He's the most sort of racist of the founding fathers. Um, he has the, the, the most trouble with, with, uh, with blacks. He can't stand uh, that Shakespeare wrote Othello, for example. He finds it vulgar. Um, but another sort of second tier founding father is Benjamin Rush, who in 1773 uh, writes a pamphlet uh, denouncing slavery and, and, and ridiculing the idea that skin color is the basis on which we, on which we hold uh, these people in captivity. It's just a, an absurd concept that nobody could believe in, the, in, these, in this day and age. Uh, but then when Notes on the State of Virginia comes out, he's one of the most dedicated uh, Jeffersonians. He's extremely loyal. He's in a quandary because Jefferson has said that, 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 that you know, he's got this, this Manichaean division into black and white. Um, so he writes a a, uh, a pamphlet in the 1780s um, in which he's discovered, he's a physician, he's discovered or he postulates to be sure that it's right, that the black color of Africans is a form of leprosy and uh, that they are not inferior, they're just sick. So of course we have to stay away from them so we don't catch it, we have to isolate ourselves from them, but it certainly means that we don't have to, that we shouldn't uh, 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 disparage them. We should have extra pity for them uh, since they're going through this, this problem. And once we cure them, we'll all be able to live happily together. Crazy, right? But you have to take, what is your, what is your core belief around which all your other beliefs uh, have to you know, sort of stand at attention? And for, for Rush, his core belief was Thomas Jefferson. Uh, so he had to make adjustments in everything else that he believed. And you can find that in many, many cases. It's, it's a fascinating uh, thing to see. Well, this is... Curious about the publication of the uh, papers of Thomas Jefferson. Is that an ongoing project? I know it's at Princeton University. Is, is that still going on? Are they and have they still not published an edition <laughs> of Notes on the State of Virginia? And I'm, and who is the publisher of your edition? Uh, it's it's published by Yale, which has a lot of good books uh, on Monticello. Um, I got the go ahead, I got a green light from Barbara Oberg, who is the editor of the Papers of Thomas Jefferson. They, they were relieved, I think, uh, that they didn't have to do an edition. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty, well, I've, I'm, I've been working on, I worked on it for uh, almost 11 years, so you can see why they, uh, they were happy to pass on that. Uh, it's still going on. But most of the work now, most of the, 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 the sort of um, key uh, path-breaking work on the Jefferson Papers is in the retirement series. Uh, and and that, that is edited by uh, Thomas Jefferson Looney uh, out of the um, International Center for, for Jefferson Studies uh, at Monticello. Um, so it's going on uh, with great vigor, uh, but they're, Winding it down uh, in, in at Princeton, the 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 pre-retirement uh, papers. Why did Princeton get it and not UVA? Why did Princeton get it and not UVA? Uh, I don't know all of the politics of that, but 
the the guy who was the first editor was was uh, Julian Julian. Um, come on, right. Uh, he was a very canny politician uh, as well as being a, a Princeton man. Um, I think they were probably able to draw the uh, the the uh, d the um, philanthropic uh, contributions in a way that UVA uh, was unable to do that. But <clears throat> the folks at the Mass Historical Society who really like to rub it in, uh, like to say there there are more pages of of Jefferson's uh, uh, manuscripts uh, at the MHS than in the state of Virginia. <laughs> Now, according to my clock, we have gone over the, uh, the allotted time, so uh, I'll, I'll, we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much.